gospel reading today comes to us from St. Matthew's Gospel. And it is part of a section of the Apostles' Gospel called the Olivet Discourse. That's a technical name given to it by those who <coughs> specialize in Gospel studies. And the reason it's given this name is because when the Lord delivered this and many other sayings with it, uh, he was on the Mount of Olives. <clears throat> and this Mount of Olives is directly located across from the temple. Now the Lord found himself on this mount because they had just departed the temple after several very eventful days uh, that had just preceded this moment. <clears throat> It began when the Lord made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He then cleansed the temple. He had multiple confrontations with the socio-political and religious leaders of Israel. And the result of this was a great uproar. We can say that Jerusalem was uh, in, in a tremor. It was uh, a time like a very few times in the past. And you can imagine when goodness, when purity, when God comes before mankind, that the powers of darkness are shaken, and at this moment it was no different. They could take no more, and thus they began to gather against our Lord. The Sanhedrin, or the ruling council of Israel, plotted his death, and the demonized disciple Judas, Iscariot, was just about to commit his final treachery. It's at this point, standing directly across from the temple, the center of Israel, that the Lord delivers these words that we heard today. They were preceded by prophecies of destruction of the temple. He called his disciples to discern the times. He then tells them several parables, the parable of the fig tree and the lesson of Noah, and the parable of two servants, and the parable of ten virgins, and of the talents. And what is the goal of all of these parables but to teach us and those who were there to continuously, always, at all times, be ready for the return of the Lord? That's a big lesson. You see, it was intended to convey this message because it's one that we so easily forget. The sad fact is that most of us really aren't ready. Consider this question. Would you look forward to the Lord returning tomorrow? How about this afternoon? Are you ready? Are you prepared? There's a reason why we're often not ready, and it's because we spend most of our efforts and most of our energies on other pursuits. Good pursuits. Excellent pursuits at times. Great education, great career, uh, great retirements, uh, etc., depending upon where your age might be. I'm keeping healthy and I'm keeping fit, all of which are great. But if that's it, if that's all we're looking at, then we're nearsighted and we miss the larger story, the larger narrative, which is preparing for this day of Christ's return. It's a great challenge, it's not a small one. And it's difficult because there is always something in the way. Now the Lord gives us a description in this challenge. He tells us that on this day when he returns, there will be the appearing of the Lord. And then there will be a gathering for the judgment of mankind. And third, there will be a response of those judged. And we can place ourselves in this narrative because we will be there. This is what has been called historically the apocalypse. Now I have to say the apocalypse does not mean the tragedy of all time when everyone dies and the world is destroyed. That, that is not the meaning of the term. The term apocalypse is a Greek term which means unveiling or revelation and uncovering. You see, the narrative sets out that there will be a time 
one Christ and the kingdom of heaven. And all of these things that we see depicted here will be visible to our eyes. The gospel says it like this. But whenever the Son of Man should come in his glory and all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. This is a description of the great revealing, the great apocalypse. And the scriptures in this revelation tell us that this other dimension, this other world, is going to become visible to us. And this means that not only the Lord, but his angels, all of his angels will come and allow us to see him. We can't see it now. Why? Because our spiritual eye, our noose is darkened with sin and corruption, and this world is invisible to us. But that will not be what happens at the apocalypse. It will be wide open. One day the Lord will come and lift this veil, and it's going to occur for one purpose, for the judging of creation and most particularly mankind who has been tasked with the job of becoming like God. It's, it's, a, it's a critical point. We are the only creatures who have been tasked with the job of becoming like God. And the whole reason for the apocalypse is not primarily for bringing about destruction, far from it, but for bringing about goodness and the total perfection of God's creation. That is its goal. The problem is, we're not ready for this event. We haven't all been preparing, and even if we have, we haven't always done it to the best of our ability. We haven't been looking within ourselves to destroy that which is corrupt, which is suppressing goodness. We haven't been pursuing the most valuable pursuits at all times, which is God. This is the reason the Lord emphasizes in this entire discourse to be ready. Because on that day, the whole creation will be revealed as well for what we really are. You see, there are three characters here. Firstly, there's the Lord himself, who he calls the Son of Man. It's a very important term because it tells us that Christ isn't coming to judge us just as a God outside of creation. No, he is coming to make a judgment as one of us, who was in every way tempted like us who knows everything we've ever known, who's experienced everything we've ever experienced, he will judge us as our peer. In fact, he is the ultimate jury of our own peers. Secondly, the Lord will come with his angels, seraphim and cherubim, and thrones and dominions and powers and authorities and principalities and archangels and angels. And all of these will encompass the creation. And thirdly, the nations. The nation will refer to every people group and everyone in it. For our purposes, you and me. These folks spoken of are gathered for classification and separation. It's, point, it's important because in our English translation, uh, the term is used as sheep and goats. In the Greek and in the earlier translations and in other languages, it doesn't really have that delineation. It does say the sheep, but as far as the goats, it, it uses the term for baby goat or baby lamb. And, and the goal is not to say that sheep are good and goats are bad. It's to say, according to St. John Chrysostom, that sheep are an animal that provide us with all that we need in this life. It provides us with wool for our clothing, with hide, with, with meat, with milk. Uh, it, it's a very useful and helpful creature. While the baby goat or the baby lamb is none of those. In fact, it's a drain on the rest of us because they produce nothing. So the point here is that you have a group of people that God separates, our God in Christ, as those who are useful and helpful and those who are not. It's just an identification of a reality. It is not a judgment of saying, I like you and I don't like you. It is, this is who you are and this is who you are. And that is where the separation is made. Consequently, when we sit, we will be found to be one of those who are useful or one who is not. And here is the basis for that decision. 
Do we love mankind? And are we compassionate with mankind? Or not? It's very confusing to the disciples and to those hearing this because they didn't understand the example that Christ gave us. God, we didn't see you in prison or hungry or naked, and thus we did this. But what we do see is that one group loved and was compassionate and served, and the other group did not. And this, this love for a human fellow is what Christ does, is what God does. The ultimate God likeness is to love and be compassionate. And if the goal, therefore, of mankind is to be loving and compassionate, to be like God, that is the ultimate end. This is where we're going. And you see why love and compassion is the thing. It is the thing. But if we're honest, loving and being compassionate can be very difficult at times. It's easy to look at this list. Consider the people in prison. It's not easy to be loving and compassionate to the people in prison. It simply isn't. Well, because we kind of look at ourselves and we say, we're not like them. We didn't do that. But the saints in our glorious tradition tell us that if you look deep down inside, eh, we're probably just a tad better. Because we didn't act out on some of our thoughts. And so the fact of the matter is that we confess, as we're going to hear before communion, that we are first chief among sinners. And we either mean that, or we're lying when we say this. This is who we are, and this is why we can be compassionate, and why we can love those who seem unlovely. We're to love our fellow man because they are like us, and in serving them, we serve Christ, and we are useful just as sheep are useful. It is this usefulness to God and man that will separate us in the end. It is this love that will determine our union to God for eternity. The goal of our Lord is for us to love and to be compassionate with one another. And as we enter this Lenten season, may that goal be ever-present in our hearts as we use this time of repentance to become like our God, Jesus Christ. And together with His unoriginal Father, His life and His Spirit is forever glorified.